Hey bookends, I'm 10. So I'm currently waiting for an event to start. It is the uh, intimate Q&A for Santonia Brown Long. So you may have remember hearing about her in the news. Um, she was convicted as a child of murdering someone or basically with self-defense. And uh, she really didn't get a fair trial, so there's that. And she was released earlier this year, and she has a book out, a autobiography. And so, yeah, I'm going to be doing a Q&A. Well, I'm not going to be doing a Q&A. I'm going to be at a Q&A for her. So that is awesome. Cannot wait for that to start. It's going to be a third space, which is a shared office space. So it's kind of cool. But yeah, can't wait to go. See you soon, bookends. So I'm inside third space waiting for the Q&A to get started. So have you ever been like excited and like you can't, you don't know why you're excited, but you're like super excited. That is how I'm feeling right now. I really did think her story was an interesting one. I never thought that she should have gone to jail in the first place. I was, you know, really young when I when her whole story came out but I don't remember it being too much in the news but when it was brought up again a few years maybe two years ago that Centoya like what had happened to her why she had gone to jail how she didn't really get her due process I was like, oh my god, that's horrible, especially for the reason why it happened. So I really am excited to see what it is she has to say, and it's heartening to see how resilient she is, like how she just got out this year, and yet she already has an autobiography out, and she's ready to share her story. So that is wonderful, and I can't wait to hear her story and hear how exactly she was able to make it through everything that she had to go through personally and what it is she has planned for the future. Okay, so Rutgers yes. is selling uh, her book here, like at Third Space, so that's awesome. So just got, bam, just got my copy. And I believe she is also doing signing, so I can't wait to get it signed as well. I think we have like 15 minutes or so left until everything starts, so <laughs> yay! We have a lot of questions for her, but not too many. We do want to give her an opportunity to tell her story. Now, I am going to explain this to her as well, but I did not know about Santoya's story until it started to that I didn't know your story until social media and how I was kind of embarrassed by that. Like, how do I not know that this is happening until Rihanna says about, talks about it on Instagram? What were your feelings when you first started to see your story gaining traction with celebrities? Um, well, I was really happy when I started to see it everybody. Yes. Um, I didn't get caught up on the whole celebrity thing, but it was just the sheer number of people just all across the world, people from all walks of life. And it was it was just so incredible because like you said, people don't know the story. People don't know these things are happening and it's so common and you really don't know what's going on. With it. That's actually the next question I wanted to ask and then we're going to go back a little bit. I have two daughters. And one of the things I thought about when I was reading your book, I think we would like to think that it happens to those girls. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen to our girls. It doesn't happen to the girls we know, but it does. Tell me a little bit about, in your opinion, what can be done to take away this idea that it only happens to them? I mean, I can just tell you from my experience, it can happen to anyone. You know, I was raised in a good home. My mother took me to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. She's never been in trouble 
anything in her life. I was always in a gifted program at school. I mean, there's 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 nothing that that says that one child is more likely to fall victim to it than another because just by their very nature of being children, like, that makes you vulnerable. There's many things that that you take in around you that make you think I need to do certain things to be accepted. Social media is horrible for that. And, you know, that gets in your mind. And, and before you know it, like, you're out there doing whatever because you want to be accepted by some man, because you want you want to feel wanted by a man. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to your daughter. It can happen to anyone. One of the things I also want to talk about, I want to be in the now as much as possible with you because there's so many amazing things happening with you in the now, including with this book. Uh, something I talk about a lot is the idea of self-care. That's like a buzzword now, like we're trying to be more mindful. What does self-care look like for you today? Considering where you, this is all pretty new, and working on this, like all the things we have going on, do you have time for self-care and what does that look like? Oh, I'll make time for that. Like, yeah. Yeah, no matter what. Um, I'll just shut everything down, you know, spend time with God. The first thing I do every morning is I pray, I thank God. Amen. And I just really think about where He's brought me. You know, no matter where I am, I sit and I just focus. Like, you know, look what I'm doing now. Look what God has me doing. Look what He's been able to do. And I just have that time and just really get in His face. In 2015, you received your college degree. And what I thought was fascinating about that, I was looking at the photo of you um, on your graduation day, and I saw a light in your face that's still there now. In every picture I've seen of you, I've never seen you look dejected. Even when you were sad, you didn't look dejected, which is different. Is that something you can remember always having, like this positive energy, even when things are not necessarily going well? Yeah, so there was always something in me that told me that, you know, I had to keep pushing, that I had to go on. And I didn't know it then, but, you know, that was God the whole time, pushing me on and letting me know, like, things were going to be okay. Even when they told me that I had life, like, I didn't. I didn't. I still, when it came time to, to talk about things, and some girls would be like, yeah, if I get it out, and if I win. No, when I get out. Mm -hmm. When my conviction is overturned. Always, from which, the very beginning? Yeah, always, which it was not turn, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, so always, like, you know, I held on to that. And I just had that defiance. Where I don't, care, I don't care what they say, I don't care what the court says. And, you know, it doesn't matter what man says, it's what God says. Mm -hmm. The book actually opens with you going into the courtroom to hear from the jury. And it says that you looked out to see if you could make eye contact with anybody um, on the jury pool and they, no, no one wanted to look at you, which is usually a sign. And you thought to yourself, maybe 15 years. What did it feel like hearing them say, first degree murder, which comes with an automatic life sentence? Yeah, I was devastated. And there's a part of me, like after it happened, it was relieved because, you know, you're always, not knowing, you're always looking for some kind of sign. So I was desperate to kind of figure out something. Like looking like, they look away at that part and, oh, he kind of shook his head, what does that mean? But, you know, there was just this sense of finality, like whenever they said, okay, life, I'm like, okay, well that's good. Now I need to figure out how to beat it. How am I gonna get out now? Um, but that moment, like when it came, it was like, Ooh. You know, it's like the room just like was so still. And it's kind of like, you know, I just felt like I was falling, but I was sitting still. I don't know if anybody here right now can actually fathom the words she's saying, knowing that we are talking about a 16-year-old mm -hmm. who's hearing those words. Well, I was 18. Well, 18 at that point, but for something that had happened at 16. Okay. We're talking about a teenager hearing those words. I can't, it's very hard for me to fathom that, going back and knowing this is what they've said. And you were telling me that even then you said, let's go, it's time to keep fighting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I had my time where it was like, 
you know, it sunk in, and for a while I was like, man, this is messed up, because I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll get five years for manslaughter, at the worst, you know, second degree, I'll get 15 years, and I can do this, and then this will happen, and then my <coughs> wife is like, wait, what? You're telling me I have to do 51 years for anything? Like, I've, I've never had a driver's license. Mm -hmm. I, I've never been able to legally buy cigarettes, <laughs> you know, and so it's like, wow, like you're telling me like, that's it, like I'm done, like you're not even going to try to work with me, you're not going to show me any kind of compassion, like it's just, it's over. Yeah. Now in 2009, your case was kicked down from the Supreme Court. Tell me a little bit about what happened and what you were trying to get at that time, in 2009? Anything, anything else in mind. So, you know, we were going, that was the direct appeal in 2009. So you have three appeals. You have a direct appeal, which is at the end of your trial, whenever they pronounce you as guilty, you can file a motion for a new trial. The judge is almost always gonna rule against it because you're trying to say that he was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so you appeal that, and it was from the <coughs> trial court to the Court of Criminal Appeals and to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually refused to even hear. Right, they just sent it right back down. Yeah, and whenever I had got the decision, you know, I found out that the person that was a prosecutor on that case was actually my instructor for Lipscomb, which that, that's in the book, so I'm not gonna tell you that story, but you may have heard a little about it. Maybe not, but it's in the book. Um, so that was difficult, and I know like the day that I had that, you know, I had to go right back to class, mm. had to act normal. I think they were taking yearbook pictures at night. If it wasn't that appeal, it was the next appeal. And so you kind of just really don't even have time to process it. You just kind of just have to pull it together and keep going. And so that, that speaks to how you said when I would always like be smiling. There was like interviews that I was doing, um, you know, about about school. Yeah, I've about seen school those. And, yes. and like, I and remember one vibrant and yeah. together. And, yeah, one of them I had done the day after I was told I lost my bill. And, you know, I just kind of had to step it up. Just keep pushing. I wouldn't know what I got. Now see, I'm a writer. And let me find out that I got a lot of edits to do on a story. I'm laid out <laughs> for days. And this is another, this is a different level of strength that I don't think a lot of us are familiar with. So it's 2009. It looks like it's not going to happen. Yet, here we are 10 years later. Yeah, and that was just the first appeal that was denied. You got to think I had another appeal that was denied. And every time you always think, like, this is going to be it. This is going to be the time that they're going to give me something. They're going to reduce it maybe to 25, maybe to 15, but something, because surely somebody's going to see that this isn't right. You know, it's just too much time for, I was a child, but no, like no court, and not even the federal court. The federal court told me that my case was dismissed and they wouldn't even allow me to appeal because whenever you're done with the federal appellate courts, after you've exhausted your state appeals, they have to actually give you permission to appeal. They weren't even gonna give permission to appeal it. And it just seemed like it was over. Clemency was the only option in less than 1% of applications. Mm -hmm. are accepted, mm -hmm. and so it was like, yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about clemency because um, there's a difference between clemency and being pardoned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would that have been an option as well? So clemency is, you know, it's the power by which the governor can grant you relief. He can either give you a commutation, exoneration, or pardon. Exoneration is what you see with death penalty. Uh, pardons or when they completely wipe away your criminal history and a commutation is when they just reduce your, your time. And so I got a commutation, which means I'm still convicted. I still have that conviction on my record, but I'm free. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Does that mean legally that at some point you could still be pardoned on top of that? Or are those yeah. two separate things? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, even though they told me 10 years parole, like, I know God can turn that around too. Like, that can get cut down even more. I know it's a possibility. It could be wiped down. Like, I don't put nothing past him. But yeah, everything is a possibility. What's next for you? Well, we are working now on setting up my nonprofit foundation, my husband and I. Um, hopefully, it'll be up running by the beginning of next year. But it's the Foundation for Justice, Freedom, and Mercy. 
um, on Santa J. Plant Foundation. And one of our first campaigns is actually going to be the Glitter Project, which was something that you know, I had doing years when ago. I was in prison, something that I thought of then. And kind of doing it like, you know, just like really grassroots now, just going into the schools, um, work with some of the girls in the detention center through a local group called Epic Girl back in Tennessee and just talking with them about some of the things that can make them more susceptible to be, you know, exploited, mm -hmm. helping them to understand like healthy relationships, some unhealthy thought patterns that can put us in positions where, you know, our boundaries are not what they should be and, you know, just how important that is and really just building relationships with them because, you know, it's important for young girls to have healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, you could easily have been released, went somewhere and sat down, and just took a breather. You didn't. Why? No, 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 I can't do that. Like, if only you knew, like, what it feels like to have a miracle like this performed in your life. Like, I have to get out of here. He's real, he can do it for you too. And with me experiencing everything that I experienced, knowing the people that I left behind, you know, you, you hear all about people in prison, but you think they're these horrible people. They're, they're just defined by that one moment in their life, but I was with these women. I know, no, they are just like me and you. They're someone's daughter, they're someone's sister, they're someone's mother, like these are people, and they have no voice. And if I'm given an opportunity if I'm given a platform, like, I'm, I'm going to voice that for them. I'm going to be that voice for them. That's amazing. Thank you. So we are going to take some questions from the audience, a few, before we do our signing. Mm -hmm. So where are we going to start? I have a mic here. Right here. Say 18, most popular in the yearbook, whatever, your prom coming up. So, what, co what car would you come in? What color would your car be? <laughs> and what song would you pull up to your prom in? <laughs> <laughs> Any song of all time. Yeah, I, I will tell you that I've always like seeing like how people pull up with a mic. Alicia's mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I would probably want to pull up in a convertible. Like I have no limit, right? No budget, no nothing. Like no that. budget. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would probably pull up in a convertible. What was the other question? The car. Or <laughs> the song. What color would it be? And what song would you pull up in? I don't know what color. See, I'm not car person. That's my husband. <laughs> Let's just say silver. Um, I'm like, how she had a color ready, though. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably wear, probably red, because it looks good on my skin color. And mm -hmm. I wear it for some reason. What color does it? Yep. <laughs> and the song, I don't know. I was, what, would it, what year was that? That was like 2006. Let, let's say you could do prom today. So even if it came out, even if the song came out after that. Won't we do it? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, first of all, my name is Nicole, and I want to say thank you so much for being here because you like just watching you and your fierceness. It's kind of encouraging. It's more than kind of. It is encouraging, right? So we're all going through trials and tribulations, and sometimes it's hard for us to actually see the blessings that like that are open to us or like that are available to us because we're living in it. So you've gone through something so traumatic, but you're, like, just seeing the smile on your face, it's just saying, it's motivating. So what would you tell your younger self? Like what's the advice that you would give your younger self when the times were looking like, like you didn't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel? I'll tell you something. So 
one of the pastors that had come to the, the prison, and I always tell myself this, I hung on to it. He said one time in his sermon, he was talking about a, a boy and his uh, father. They were climbing a mountain and rope or whatever, and so the father was higher up on the rope. And the son, he was lower, and the rope had started to break, and he started to panic. He was like, Dad, Dad, like I'm about to fall. They're way up there, you know? Like, I don't know how, how he told the story. I'm probably telling <laughs> And they're way up there, so he's freaking out because here's this rope, and it's just like unraveling, and it's been a, it's been a terror. He's thinking he's going to crash to the ground. He's going to die and everything. And his father is like, calm down, son. It's okay. Just all you have to do is just take your hand and then reach past that breaking point. Mm. And you just keep climbing. And it's like, wow. <laughs> like, that's dope. I don't know who came up with that. <laughs> and so, like, that's just what I just kept telling myself. Like, there were so many nights where I felt like, man, like, I can't do this. Like, I cannot spend my life like this. And it was like, I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to know that there is going to be a better day. Like, it's going to get better. You know, God, He has a plan. Like, He has a will for our lives, and He only wants what's good for us. So, whatever it is, I may feel like it's rough right now. I may feel like it's hard, but He could be protecting me from something. He could be, you know, sitting me down because He's got something better coming. I don't know. I'm just going to trust whatever He's doing. Yes. I'm Jessica Kitts and I'm with Volunteer Lawyers for Justice. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for um, helping to support the LJ. Thank, thank you for what you did. Yeah. Um, so we have a, um, the New Jersey Trafficking Victims Legal Assistance Program and we're doing work to do vacature um, for survivors um, of trafficking who have criminal convictions here. We're also working on the national level. I'm wondering, are you connected with, or do you want to get connected with some of the sort of legal organizations that are working to get Clemency, certainly for folks who are um, still in, but also to clear the records, um, yours included, it sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I have read some stuff, like, you know, I, I haven't really been on my much, but, you know, about a couple of individuals, like two names that have popped out, Alexis Martin, I think, and Crystal Kaiser. So I've read about that. And, like, I know that not just them, but there are people, like, there are names that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many names that we don't know, people who have no idea of even how to put their names out there. Like, I know these women, they didn't even know where to start to get their names put out there. And we need to find out some way to find out who they are, number one. And number two, which probably should actually be number one, we have to, like, get people in the, the system to understand that, you know, you need to take this into consideration, like the circumstances. You can't just look at this sentencing grid and think, okay, these are the facts of the case, and this is what needs to happen. No, honey, like, you need to understand that like, there are certain mitigating factors that you're going to have to take into consideration. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's important work, and I would absolutely, like, you know, love to learn more about what you guys are doing and the group that you're working with. Thank you. Here we go. Hi. First of all, thank you for coming here to Newark. I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask the ladies from She Wins to stand up. Um, this organization here for girls in the city of New York. They've been studying you for two summers. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> None of them raised their hand, but I'm going to ask if any of you want to say something to Satoya, because you know her story. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, what advice would you give me at this age if I'm going through any trials and tribulations in my life? I mean, in addition to, you know, what I just said, like, when I was your age, I don't know, like, where you are, but I always felt like I needed to do things to be accepted. I always felt like I needed to fit in, and I always felt like I didn't necessarily fit in. And what I know now, as a 31-year-old woman, is that there's always going to be somebody that has something negative to say about me. But the thing is, like today, I don't base who I am. I don't base how I feel about myself off of what somebody else has to say. I base it off 
of how Jesus feels about me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like that's all there is to it. That's never gonna change. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to do anything for his love. And I mean it is what it is. People are gonna say what they say, but I don't know if that's helpful for you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello to everybody. I'm one of the only men here, so I'm going to represent. <laughs> Number one, uh, you can see this shirt I have on. I'd like to pass this to you. Yes. This is an organization of women that's unique because it actually fits into your paradigm as far as young women and young girls that's actually being incarcerated at the fastest rate that we've ever seen in the United States of America. So, um, again, I'd like to welcome you to the your note. I'm glad you're here. Um, if you could actually open this up and get a chance and read it, you'll see. And again, it's hashtag free her. Because again, we need to free these women. It's a lot of men going down. We know that, but it's a lot of our sisters. And without our sisters, we ain't gonna have no, we ain't gonna have no generation to get left. Plain and simple. So I'm just trying to be a male to stand up. Welcome you here. See your husband back there. Salute you. Um, and that's pretty much, I'm just glad you're here in the city of Newark. And if you get a chance, please read this pamphlet. There's a business card in there. Call those sisters up and they need you. They need you. You could be the matriarch for the organization. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, as everybody is saying, for being in the great brick city. Um, I'm, my name is Shakia. I'm literally known as Purple. And I have a great accountability because I'm an artist. So I get to translate things lyrically. And an even higher accountability now, I'm assisting with the team in getting young people to express themselves through the arts. And something that just came to me right now is, what was the relationship of specifically hip hop, rap, that you think um, adds to a situation like yours? And how could it offer something? Like, what is the language? What, what do the words, what would you want your soundtrack to say then and now? On one end, we create in, on another end, we create in, we, we, we kill them. still. Yeah. Right? I can say some things that it probably shouldn't be saying. Mm -hmm. um, I accept that. You know, the whole objectifying women, I can think of how that's negative. For me in particular, around this time, um, that I was getting into things, like, I mean, I was, like, you could tell me I wasn't hot. <laughs> and then now when I look back at that song and I think of the words, it's like, wow, like, what was I telling myself? And so like that really, I think that really has an effect. And the music that we listen to, the movies, like the things that we glorify and we come to teach our girls that that's okay. And we learn ourselves like this is what's acceptable. Like that, that has a bigger effect honest and you know. And so when I think back to some of the music that I was listening to, I can say like, okay, so that's, there's that. You know? But you're gonna get me in trouble with this. No, that's I'm also a U.S. diplomat, so next week we're doing media literacy in the United States, you know, alum. And like, I really get to be in this conversation around what we want media literacy to Yeah. And so I'm gonna take all of what I'm gonna yeah, if we could be a little bit more respectful to women in song, that would be great. <laughs> Hi, Sim Boy. Hello. It's a little hard to follow up after that one. <laughs> um, but before my question, I'd just like to say it's absolutely a true miracle. It is. To be looking at you right now and to be talking to you. Um, a year ago, I was down in D.C. and I was homeless and I felt like I didn't want to live anymore. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter was sitting next to me and she turned me on to you. And I watched a video of you and I thought, my goodness, I have no worries after, after you know, seeing you on video. And um, I wrote you a letter. And my daughter's laughing. Oh, you wrote Satoya? Of course I wrote Satoya. <laughs> and, and which leads to my question was, um, I'm just wondering how many letters did you get? Was it possible to even keep up with them? And did you get to read all of them? And 
and, and do you still have them? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, they were so good. So I have them, they're scattered around <laughs> because like in the in the cell that I was in, you can only have like so much property. It has, I think it's like two by two, two feet by two feet of property, and that has to include everything. And so I got so many letters that I would have to send them out, and I would send them out in the copy paper boxes, like the big boxes. So I have like I want to say either five or six copy paper boxes, like filled with letters at my mother's house. I've got one at our house, at my attorney's office, two of my attorney's offices. So I got a lot of letters. Um, I did not write back. <laughs> it was a lot. Like in the beginning, like I was like, yes, I'm gonna respond to everybody. <laughs> they took the time to write me, I'm gonna write them too. And then it's like, well, these stamps are expensive. Um, <laughs> a lot of letters. But I'm gonna keep them. And I made it a point to read every single one of them. So I know that I read your letter. Mm -hmm. so I did. I All right, we have two more questions. Hi, Centoria. My name is Zarina. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, my breath is a little bit. I'm a little nervous uh, just being here, being able to talk to you. But um, my first question, it plays off of the quote that you have on the back of the book. So being that you were so young and a lot of your transformative years was spent in you know, such an environment of being in prison, um, how did you really like embody that to transform yourself into the woman you are today? And, you know, just like when you said, not just going and taking a breather, but really hitting the ground running after being in such a traumatizing environment and being so young and for such a long time. So, the prison environment, it's, it's not at all, it's not at all an environment where they want you to change, where they're really gonna help you change. Right. And a lot of the times when they see you trying to change, they're gonna come again. Mm -hmm. right. And so, like, yeah, through all that, like, when I tell you, it just made me, like, want it that much more, just to spite you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to thrive in spite of you. Mm -hmm. And I studied as much as I could. I worked on myself as much as I could. And when I tell you, I spent every waking moment just dreaming about being here, just thinking about it. Whenever something happened, like, you know, I was like, I'm going to fight to change that. There were several people that would piss me off. And I said, one day I'm going to come back and be the commissioner and I'll fire you. Mm -hmm. it's gonna <laughs> and, you know, that got me through. And so just most of the time it was just, you know, I'm, these people, they expect me to fail. They expect me to be nothing. And it's just not going to happen. I'm not going to let them have that power over me. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Alfred Edmonds Jr. I'm an entrepreneur in residence here at Third Space. But this question I want to ask you is in the context of what my wife, Dara Green, and I do. We have a business called Grown Zone Relationship Education, GrownZone.com. And it's based on the premise that we are all, especially young people, are subject to being exploited, in domestic violence, intimate partner violence, primarily because none of us are really taught what a healthy education looks like. We find out by trial and error, and often it's very costly trials and error. So I'm interested in, in the work you're going to be doing with young girls, um, young women, about helping them to understand, well, I'm asking you, there's a lot of me about helping them understand what does a healthy relationship look like so that you can make better choices that will take you on healthier paths uh, as you decide who you're going to become intimate with, who you're going to engage with and why. Yeah, so number one, like the biggest thing that we talk about whenever we have groups is the importance of like, you have to learn how to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to learn how to value yourself. You have to learn where to, to base how you value yourself on. And it's not with another person. And until you get that together, like, you can't go on to have a relationship with someone else. And so we really talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about boundaries, you know, about, like, sometimes you feel like, OK, I'm going to do anything for this person. But you can't continue to sacrifice yourself for people like that. You get what I mean? Not in a healthy way. And so we spent a lot of time talking about that because I was never I was never really taught that, you know, and I was learning things from adults, not my, not my parents, let me just clear that up, but like, you know, older adults and they weren't healthy themselves. Like they didn't understand healthy relationships. They didn't understand. And so like my whole perception was skewed, you know, I felt that 
relationships were a vehicle for me to be financially stable, for me to be warm. Like that's, that's just not what that is. And so yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about what it's not, because a lot of times they don't know that. And like you said, nobody's teaching them what it is and what it's not. Okay, hey, this is the last question. Right. First of all, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, as a mother with a son who's currently incarcerated for a crime he hasn't committed, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to me as a mother supporting someone in a situation that they know they are in? Don't stop fighting. Like, don't just, I know sometimes it feels like the system is just not gonna let this happen, they're just convinced, but don't stop, do whatever you can. Like speak up at every opportunity, just like you're speaking to me about it. Like speak up to everybody. Like go to the governors, go to attorneys, go to DAs, like just continue. And just continue to be here for them, you know? Like it's rough, it's really rough, but it makes all the difference, you know, for him to know that there's someone out there who is fighting for them because, you know, that made, that made the difference for me. I'm, I'm assuming it's, it means something about pretty sure. I know what it meant for me, you know, and especially with him being innocent. And there's so many people who are innocent and spending all that time in prison, and it's a shame. And if you can get involved with, you know, other groups, I know the Innocence Project is, is a big one, but I know there's tons of other groups in the community that do work. And you, know, you can probably go to them to find out, but I would get involved as much as I can with the advocacy groups and everything. But just do everything you can in your power and your stop. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing I want to say, um, and I know, and I know you all will agree with me, the amount of poise and grace that's in this chair right now, I have chills. Woo. I know that we really appreciate, since we're being here with us, we are going to have her books available um, right across the hall there, and she will be available also to sign them. And we thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. person in person you know sometimes you meet people and they're not exactly the way that you thought they would be you want to take a picture huh you want to take a picture of them oh i'm blogging oh <laughs> so sometimes you meet people and uh they're not what you thought they would be but she is absolutely so hyper sweet like she is a doll and tonight was excellent and i can't wait for you guys to see the review of the book that we have out as soon as we finish reading it Okay. Good night, bookends.